Sullivan is now in session. And I'm very delighted to welcome Laura Godfrey Isaacs. Laura is an artist, midwife, and feminist academic and activist. She spent over 20 years in the arts, training in visual arts, working as a feminist academic, and running the radical live art and performance company Home Live Art. And that's available online at homeliveart.com. In 2016, she graduated as a midwife from King's College London in the UK, and now works at King's College Hospital. She aspires to bring her knowledge and experience in the arts, together with midwifery, to bring fresh interdisciplinary perspectives to inform education, practice, and research. She is currently a research associate with Digital Institute for Early Parenthood, an ambassador for Procreate Projects, and is the co-chair of the Health Policy Committee for the Women's Equality Party. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Laura Godfrey Isaacs, and it's over to you, Laura. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening, everybody from London. Um, this is my first experience of presenting an online conference. So it's a bit of an experiment for me, and maybe for you as well, if it's your first time. Um, so hopefully, we're going to have a, an interesting time together. This presentation um, I've given a few times now in different contexts. Um, I was very delighted to present it in Scotland last weekend at the MAMA conference, um, but I'll be really interested to get responses from what is now an international audience, um, from all of you that are listening. So this presentation is really based on some research that I undertook um, when I was still training as a midwife. And as Jane was saying with the introduction, my background is in the arts. Um, and in that capacity, I worked quite a lot as a feminist academic and was very interested in the way that women's bodies were framed within art, um, particularly from a feminist perspective. And I found as I was training as a midwife, these kind of views about how that informs midwifery practice was maybe slightly missing from the training, which is one of the reasons I decided to do this as my dissertation and now develop it as as a sort of bigger presentation for conference contexts. So I really undertook a multidisciplinary literature review from around 1980 to um, 2017. Um, and I was really trying to investigate how birth in the media it depicts um, the body, depicts birth, depicts pregnancy, and how that would affect women's expectations and experiences of childbirth. You can see two images there, for instance, on the left-hand side um, might be familiar to you. Um, it's an image by the photographer Annie Leibovitz of the movie star Demi Moore from 1991. And this is really cited in a lot of the literature as being a sort of key iconic image where pregnancy and, by extension, birth was sort of glamorized for the first time in the media, um, possibly even fetishized. And it's seen as a sort of key moment. And that image has been plagiarized and parodied by, by many people. It's, it still seems to have power. And I think what's interesting on the right-hand side is nearly 30 years later is an image by Beyonce, by um, a, a male photographer called Awel Ikenru. And this is interesting because it seems to reference the Demi Moore image. but. Beyonce, it could be suggested, is very much more in control of how she is being portrayed as a potential mother. Um, she takes a lot of care over the way that, that her body is portrayed in the media. And you have an image that is quite complex. Um, it portrays her almost like a sort of Madonna, an idolized mother, but also it's quite sexualized with the um, underwear. And it's quite a contentious image. It's, it's had a lot of sort of conflicting readings. Um, so I just wanted to start with those two images, really. One that, in a way, kind of has started this kind of fetishization of pregnancy and birth in the media, and one very up-to-date one that, in a way, suggests how problematic it still is in terms of how it's portrayed in the media. 
So I'm just going to go on to the next slide. And I think what's interesting to consider at the moment, and I'm talking mostly in a sort of Western context here, is how we really are bombarded with images of birth and in a way that are unprecedented representations of birth in the media now. Um, Marianne, for instance, would suggest that we live in an electronic age where there is a convergence of media, including reality TV, Hollywood rom-coms, new media, internet, apps, social media. And Fleming et al. talks about how women will have a media-informed birth. And some of the research in the box at the bottom really seems to stress this. 82% of American first-time mothers in childbirth connections access media content weekly. And this is often daily as well. They're getting often um, daily updates, texts on their phones. They're using apps daily. Um, furthermore, an international survey of 24 countries found pregnant women use the internet up to 10 times during their pregnancy. And that's probably quite a conservative estimate. And a European survey found that 71% of all internet use was for so-called health-seeking behavior, which you could perhaps um, put, put this in the category of. Therefore, this idea that women will have a media-informed birth, I think, is, is really quite highly substantiated by this research. And again, if you look at the two contrasting images on the right-hand side, you have one at the bottom, maybe from around the 50s, where birth is seen as a, as a kind of a, a quite a sterile, it's a, a very sort of controlled environment. Um, the first birth in the UK on the BBC was in 1957, and that was described as disgusting and tasteless. Whereas if you contrast that with, for instance, the above image, which is um, from a Hollywood rom-com film called The Backup Plan with Jennifer Lopez, you know, these images now are really ubiquitous in the media and are often seen as funny. You know, they're, they're comedies, they're highly mediated, um, they're highly dramatized. So what's, what I wanted to do now was to sort of look at how mainstream media tends to depict birth. And really what seems to happen is that mainstream media tends to reinforce and normalize certain dominant ideologies around birth. Furthermore, information is fragmented, inconsistent, weakly linked, and poorly referenced, as is suggested in research by Fleming et al. in 2014. And so what we've got, again, if we go back to the research around the amount that women are referencing images and, and information in the media, is an awful lot of information that women are trying to wade through and make sense of and find their own route through. So what I want to do now is sort of look at what are these um, dominant ideologies around birth that the mainstream media depict. Now, unfortunately, we can't show video in this presentation. So if you have access um, to a good internet connection. It'd be really interesting if you could go to this link. Um, it's a episode of an American um, hospital drama called ER. Um, was the first really um, big showing of George Clooney, the uh, film director, uh, film actor. Um, and this particular episode in 1995 was directed by the film director Quentin Tarantino, who's a very sort of famous Hollywood um, director. And what's really interesting about this episode is that it starts with a four-minute sequence showing a birth. And it's been talked about by quite a few of the studies I've looked at that, in a way, it kind of epitomizes um, the way that the mainstream media depicts birth. Um, it's, it's a four-minute sequence from the beginning of contractions to the birth of the baby. So um, it's highly dramatic. And what we're going to do now, even though we can't look at it, is just look at some of the themes that come, come through very strongly from this particular depiction. The first one being fear, danger, speed, and pain. Now, that might ring bells for you in terms of how birth is depicted in, in films and TV, particularly. Um, this um, sequence, the the woman is rushed into hospital in the car. She's having contractions in the car. She's rushed into the hospital, immediately you know, rushed into a clinical room, legs up in lithotomy, 
the doctor comes in, delivers the baby. It's a highly kind of medicalized um, situation. She's screaming. She's screaming for drugs. Um, it all happens incredibly quickly. Um, she's depicting incredible sort of pain and like she's not in control. Um, and so these themes of fear, danger, speed, and pain are really reinforced. Um, in a study by Morris and McKinty in 19, uh, 2010, uh, looking at USA reality TV, they talk about how reality TV depicts women as powerless, physicians as in control, and technology as the saving grace for women's imperfect bodies. And that, again, is very much um, stressed in that particular sequence from ER and would be in um, programs such as One Board Every Minute, as you can see from the image there. The second theme that comes out very strongly from the research is the medical model of birth. And Kitzinger in 21 talks about how this normalizes a medical narrative and therefore encourages women to submit to this potential scenario. So if that's what's being depicted, Perhaps that is a way of almost conditioning women to expect that kind of a birth and therefore more willingly go along with that scenario, even if it's not appropriate for them. Now, again, a video that um, some of you might be familiar with, which is quite relevant at this point, is by Monty Python from even further back in 1983 called The Miracle of Birth. And this is a parody of a highly medicalized birth. Um, and also talks in a way also about the woman's experience being very sort of minor and also talks about all the equipment and the sort of systems and structures around the birth. Um, if you're not familiar with it, I would suggest you have a look at it. It's, it's very funny and also rather disturbingly accurate, um, not only for 1983, but I would suggest for 2017. But again, it kind of parodies this extreme kind of medicalization um, of birth in the media. So another theme to look at is how in these representations there are very few examples of the midwifery model of care. The one that some of you might be familiar with um, from the UK is called the midwife, and this is a picture here. Um, but these depictions tend to be quite um, historical, nostalgic even, almost looking back to a bygone age that this is how birth was, relational models of care, midwifery models of care were in the past um, and quite old fashioned. Um, and there are few depictions of a sort of contemporary context um, with a very positive uh, midwifery model of care. And furthermore, the way that midwives and midwifery is portrayed maybe more in, in, in newspapers and reports is often, unfortunately, very negative. Um, Bick in 2010 talks about, in her article, Media Portrayals of Birth and the Consequences of Misinformation, how there is a use of experts to analyze negative outcomes who do not give a balanced view. Um, also, if we look at recent scandals, for instance, in the NHS in the UK, such as in Morecambe Bay, midwives are often singled out for particular scrutiny. And even more so, uh, the tabloid press in the UK is unfortunately often in the business of vilifying midwives. This is a quote from a tabloid newspaper, the Daily Mail from 2011. If you don't hurry up, I will cut you. What woman, one woman was told at NH Trust where five died. So there you have a conflation of perhaps very poor and abusive midwifery care, even linked to the idea of baby death. Another theme that comes out strongly from these mainstream media portrayals is women's diminished autonomy and agency. Media texts tend to promote, for instance, dominant social constructs around femininity, the good woman, and by extension, the good obstetric patient. You can see celebrity magazines here um, and the sort of textual narratives around them, for instance, OK in the middle, Jessica Alba, being a mum is a miracle. On the right hand side, Miranda, I thought I was going to die. And so these kind of messages of these kind of valorized um, mothers 
idealized mothers who have very little autonomy and agency themselves tends to be very much depicted in the, these types of magazines. You can also see that it um, tends to be very few uh, women of color are also depicted in these mainstream media um, representations and also it's very heteronormative. So always, you know, couples um, and no discussion around LGBT and different types of families. Now, what I want to look at now, in a way, in contrast to these mainstream media portrayals, is um, what happens with new media. So, in a way, it's quite a different story, and that new media does provide opportunities for women to create their own content, um, to interact with each other, to learn from each other, to even campaign against mainstream media depictions that they feel unhappy with, and to share information which can be empowering, though again, there can be enormous amounts of information, which again provides a, a kind of a challenge for women. So for instance, on this slide, um, there is a website in the UK called Mumsnet, um, by parents for parents, um, and there there's a lot of online parent forums where, where people can share information. At the bottom with the cross there is the positive birth movement, which again has a strong online presence. Um, for information and networking and contact, but also in the real world ha has um, support groups all over the world now for women to learn from each other and support each other. I would suggest also at the bottom with Twitter that a lot of women are using Twitter now for information, getting research, networking with each other. And you can see the large image in the middle um, where a woman has used, I think she set up a, a Facebook group, and then a, um, and it's very easy to set up petitions now. So she set up a petition, I believe it was against Channel 4, and their um, depiction of birth in One Born Every Minute. So in that slide, she's saying, women deserve the truth about childbirth, not a version made for TV. It's time for us to reclaim birth as a magical, a beautiful, magical event. Now, not everyone necessarily thinks or wants birth to be a magical, beautiful event, but through um, the internet, through new media, that woman has been able to um, campaign and probably exert some influence um, over the media. In relation to that, I think it's also quite interesting to look at media theory. Um, for example, media theory in its inception was more around this idea of the hypodermic needle theory. So the idea was that um, we as consumers of media were quite passive, that messages such as the dominant messages that I've just been talking about in the mainstream media would be received passively by the audience and therefore, and, and therefore they would take that on board. Whereas new audience research, more contemporary um, media theory, tends to suggest that audiences interpret media text due to their own social and cultural context, um, and that we as consumers of media or makers of media content ourselves can take a dominant, negotiated, or oppositional stance to media text. So we can agree with it, we can take a negotiated, or we can take an oppositional stance to it. And I think that's important to remember is that mainstream media is very powerful, but nevertheless, we ourselves have the power to interpret those texts and decide how we position ourselves against them or with them. I think also um, regulators and um, the NHS in the UK are also realising how important media messages are. Um, for instance, the Department of Health in the UK um, has a document, The Power of Information, which talks about you know, how important it, the information we give as health professionals is, but how important also all other sources of information are um, in sort of health-seeking um, behaviour by, by people that we look after. The NHS um, on its website has an area called Behind the Headlines, and this is where they specifically unpack media stories. So, for instance, you can see a tabloid newspaper there from the UK, the Daily Mail, and that story, 82% more chance of dying in surgery at weekends, at the weekends. Now, that was a media story, but I believe that has now been refuted. 
um, it was not good evidence um, and it was overblown claim and it's stories like that that will be specifically um, deconstructed in the area behind the headlines so the NHS itself um, in the UK we also have guidance on using social media responsibly from the nursing and media free council so all healthcare professionals have some guidance on how to use social media themselves responsibly and how to respond to it. Um, also in the UK there was um, a very big inquiry into um, the press, the Leveson inquiry in 2012, which was around um, the press abusing their position um, in many different ways and intrusion into people's private lives. And, and that has called for increased press policies and regulation. So I think people you know, in the NHS, healthcare professionals themselves and women clients are increasingly aware of the power of the media and the need to deconstruct these messages. So where does that leave us in terms of what sort of practice recommendations might there be from this research um, if you work directly um, with people who are pregnant or going through birth? And I think really the, the, the main sort of message is to try and support women's autonomy and decision making in birth. And Higgins et al. talks about how important it is to acknowledge health seeking behaviour, to discuss with women, you know, even at the booking appointment, you know, what, what media are you looking at? What books have you got? What films are you watching? What apps are you using? Women will often have apps now, pregnancy apps. Um, and to guide, to have a whole load of recommended sources that you can guide women to. And also to recognise that there is also, due to this phenomena, a shifting balance of power. Women are coming in often well informed or needing guidance about how to access information and how to sift through um, this avalanche of information. Furthermore, the code um, which all nurses and midwives ascribe to in the UK um, itself talks about how important it is to promote partnership working, the importance of communication, and again to recognise the contribution people make to their own health. And a national maternity review that we had in England in 2016 also talked about as an aspiration, the idea of every woman having a personalised, comprehensive digital tool. So that could be an, a place, it could be um, an app, or it could be some facility that they could access where all of this digital information could be compiled for them, and that might include their own electronic notes. So I think you know there's a recognition um, from regulators, from um, policy makers, that this is something that we all need to be engaging with and taking forward. Furthermore, as midwives or as birth workers, we can get involved, we can get connected with each other, we can be involved in creating positive content around birth. Uh, Dennis Walsh, a well-known midwife in the UK, talks about, you know, should midwives become film directors? Well, some of the images there you can see um, are of midwives in the UK who have set up blogs, websites, um, other websites such as Tell Me A Good Birth Story, where women are sharing positive birth stories. Birthing for Blokes, which was set up by a male midwife in the UK, Mark Harris, which is a space to specifically support men in birth. Um, a midwife in the UK called Clemmie Hooper, who has a, a great blog called uh, Gas and Air, there on the bottom of the right hand side, where she also has an Ask the Midwife facility. So I think whereas midwives used to be very scared of being involved in the media, um, now increasingly midwives are recognising the importance of putting out information, evidence-based information, positive information, creating spaces and forums for uh, women to connect, but also for within the profession for, for midwives to connect with each other and birth workers to connect with each other and learn from each other and support each other. I just put up this slide, which I know is possibly quite a shocking image because it's an image of a um, maternal death actually but the reason I put it up is the uh, it's from a film um, called Marina and Adrienne which was directed by Lucy Campbell for the British Film Institute Shakespeare's sister 
uh, programme, which was about supporting women directors um, for Shakespeare's birthday last year. And the actress in the back holding the woman um, is actually my daughter, Tallulah Haddon. And um, she's quite young. She's 20 years old. And she was to be the birth partner for um, this woman who um, was having an unassisted birth quite a long story but nevertheless she came to me and, and asked me you know well what what do I do to support a woman in labor you know what sort of noises does a woman make when, she, when she's in labor and talking to her you know as as her mother I was trying to give advice and help but then I also realized god this is a really important um, situation where I can possibly influence how this birth not the outcome because that was part of the narrative but nevertheless how that woman was laboring, I could influence that and try to create a more realistic, perhaps, um, um, experience for, for those that be watching the film. So that was just an example of how there are opportunities often in your own life. There are professional contexts and opportunities, but often there are also quite unexpected um, personal situations where you can intervene or interact with something in the media. So I think I'm going to leave it there um, with just a couple of um, images again from celebrity magazines um, with probably two of the most famous um, women that have been pregnant recently certainly um, in America and England so we have um, Kate on the right hand side again dramatizing delivery room drama Whereas actually she, by all accounts, had has had two um, really great midwifery-led births, but nevertheless the way that the, the media is reporting it as as um, a drama. Um, and on the left-hand side, um, rather unfortunate kind of body shaming um, around um, Kim Kardashian um, and her perhaps struggles or experiences through through pregnancy. So I'm going to leave it there, and I, I would love to take any questions that you might have. And this is Jane. I, I think that was extremely I couldn't so hear you very well. Over here. Are you in the other room? Jane. Jane. No, no, I'm nope, just here no, I'm and, just here um, and just, saying, uh, I'm just, saying I'm just saying there's some other questions in the chat box. In the chat box. Just we've got an echo somehow. Right? Echo um, I think. Do you want me to answer the question that's typed? I've yes, lost you, Jane. Yes, please. Okay, so Lindsay. Making effective films needs skills. I know I tried to script bilingual health education videos. Um, should midwives not be building creative relationships with those artists who are experienced in the field of film creation so we get our messages across so they're useful for women and families? Um, yes, but I think both. You know, I mean, I think that um, there are midwives such as myself who have an arts background. Um, who might well want to um, use those skills in midwifery. Um, I also think it's it's so much easier now to create content online. You know, there's online editing facilities. Um, I think a lot of midwives that are setting up blogs and websites are, are doing it in a way that we couldn't have done that. We couldn't have had exposure or got messages out in the way that we can um, probably even five years ago. So I certainly agree with you that, you know, collaborating with um, filmmakers and artists, absolutely, and profiling work that depicts um, birth in different ways, absolutely. But I also think um, anyone that wants to should have a go. And there are ways to do it now, which, you know, that, that didn't used to be so easily. And any other questions? Someone's talking about, um, yeah, in the show ER, they had women having horrible, difficult births all the time in emergency room. Yeah, I mean, I think that goes back again to the sort of drama 
Um, and if you think about Quentin Tarantino um, directing that episode, you know, it's probably not surprising that he would try to make birth the most dramatic version that he could imagine. Um, though he's probably, again, informed by past media representations, not probably by his own experience. That's my assumption. Um, and also what I was going to say about that, it's quite different quite difficult talking about that video without actually being able to show it. So I was going to say um, is that obviously anyone that's been involved in birth or had a baby themselves knows that it's generally very, very slow. Um, and yet the way it's depicted is always fast emergency uh, scenarios. Um, Linda talks about lots to learn on Call the Midwife. Yes, I agree. I mean, I think that even though it is a sort of nostalgic depiction um, in many ways, um, they do actually tackle some some really interesting issues. Um, and you can see in a way the sort of history of midwifery practice through it and many of you know the echoes of which we still experience now. Um, they have dealt with some really difficult issues. They've dealt with FGM, for instance, they've, they've dealt with um, domestic abuse um you know they they talk they have episodes that talk about the advent of contraception being available so I, i'm not um negative about call the midwife i was the point i was making was that that depiction of midwifery as a sort of relational practice um tends to be seen as something that happened in the past not something that is happening now unfortunately Thalidomide, yeah, you're right, that was also depicted. So, Susanna talks about the information about childbirth in media is very full of bias and the public take that information as a true fact. I mean, I think that I was trying to sort of explore that to a certain extent in the presentation, looking at sort of media theory, which tends to refute that to a certain extent. I mean, I think it's it's a mixed picture. I think that media um, representations are incredibly powerful. But I also think we as consumers of that are probably the most informed kind of consumers there have ever been. And therefore, as some of that media theory was suggesting, can take um, a different position towards those messages. And that will very much depend on our particular position personally, culturally, um, and also on our sort of degree of media literacy in a way. Do we know if there was a complete turnaround of presentation of birth, would we see a cultural change for people's expectations? I think, again, going back to the power of media, um, and I think that's why it's interesting to look at what's happening with uh, new media. And I think that the sort of increasing power of social media um, is changing things. I think the way that women activists, birth activists are chipping away at things and, you know, websites and movements such as the positive birth movement. Um, tell me a good birth story. I think those can be incredibly influential. Um, what I'd really like to see is a change in the mainstream media. Um, and I'm hoping that that is going to happen with the sort of increasing um, power and influence of social media. So, Hiranya, so many times I've talked to friends and they've fully brought into the dominant media messages around birth. How does one go about challenging that perspective respectfully? Um, yeah, I mean, I think respect is really important. I think it comes back again to what I was saying about trying to guide pregnant women. It's about maybe suggesting other sources of media, <clears throat> excuse me, that they could be looking at around birth. So guiding them to things like the positive birth movement, tell me a good birth story, um, looking at various different apps which take you through um, pregnancy and birth. And I think also maybe challenging those people in a respectful way, <coughs> excuse me, and asking them, you know, where, 
where are you getting these ideas from? And trying to explore that, explore that with them in the same way that you might with a pregnant woman, ask them, you know, well, what, what images have you been looking at? What films have you seen? And try to open up a conversation with them, um, but in a sort of non-confrontational way. <laughs> yes, I agree. The best USA mainstream media is the Ricky Lake film. Yeah, The Business of Birth. That's a very, very interesting um, sort of um, exploration of the sort of private health care and business of birth in, in, in the States. Susanna Koo, yes, it would be interesting to know what was happening before and after Call the Midwife show. Um, do you mean in, in terms of the depictions? Um, I and mean, as I was saying at the beginning, the first actual birth on the BBC in the UK was 1957, and that was described as being revolting and tasteless. So we've come a very long way from there, whereas now it's just kind of routine um, to see births um, on, on the TV particularly and in films as well. Um, and again, if you go on to YouTube, you will find thousands of um, people have actually uh, posted their own birth videos onto YouTube. So there's, there's no lack of images, that's for sure. <laughs> Not reading the USA book, what to expect when you're expecting. Yes, I mean, I think there are some great books that have come out in the UK recently. One is by the midwife that I was saying with her blog, Gatonair, called um, How to Grow a Baby and Push It Out Afterwards by Clemmie Hooper, which is a really great um, guide to pregnancy by a midwife. And also there is the Positive Birth um, book, again, um, coming from the Positive Birth movement. Um, so I think there are some, again, I would be suggesting those publications um, for, for women to be looking at. Um, I think there is, there, there's, you know, there's some great information out there, but it's helping women to, or guiding them, suggesting the ones that you think have the most balanced and sort of positive um, versions of information. And I suppose as a midwife are going to be um, depicting midwifery care in a positive way. I'm just reading some of these other questions. Oh, that's good to know. The NPR blog online about Call of Midwife is a really good follow-up too. Okay. Yeah, I mean, as I say, I think there's a lot of good information out there. Um, perhaps if the only thing you've seen as a sort of Hollywood rom-com film or um, One Born Every Minute, um, you're not going to have a very balanced view of birth. But I suppose the hope is that for someone who is preparing for birth now, they will search more widely and the facility to do that is so much easier now. Are there any other questions? Epidurals, the one All thing. Right. All right. Thank you Does so much, Laura. I'm, I'm going to see if I. I, see I, if I don't I, know if you're. Are you using, sure, are you using my headset? I am. Yep. Yeah. Okay, I'm not sure why I'm getting I'm not a horrendous sure echo. Oh, do hear you fine. Well, um, thank you so much, Laura. A really great presentation. It really um. It was a really great um, and very stimulating uh, talk about portrayal of birth in the media. And uh, we look forward to changing hearts and minds as we uh, proceed. Having been a midwife for 27 years, I have seen a huge improvement in the way women's and uh, babies' lives are, and family lives portrayed uh, in the media, even if we've still got a long way to go. 
So thank you so much. And I'll, yes, I'll find the link for the Call the Midwife blog as well uh, for that. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off the record button. And before I um, 